Robin Lundberg Show back at you. Special edition, guest edition, with a friend of mine, a former colleague of mine, a neighbor of mine, <laughs> Mr. Brandon Tierney of the, the show on WFAN. Of course, you can hear him with Sal Licata every weekday from 10 to 2. What's up, BT? Robin, how you doing, buddy? Can you hear me <laughs> down the street? <laughs> you know, it's funny. People probably have no idea about that, but we've sort of followed each other. <laughs> Or maybe I followed you, you know, not intentionally, yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I followed you throughout various walks of life. Because did you not live on the Upper West Side at one point? I did. I lived on, I uh, was between Columbus and Amsterdam. Uh, guess about eight years, well, yeah, about seven, eight years. Um, and we were both at 1050. And then I went out to Jersey. I said, hey, l- let me pay a little less, get a little more room and actually see the city. Uh, and, and I bumped into you. I was, I was, my, my little guy Colt was one and a half, maybe. Yeah, he was in a stroller. It yeah. was definitely in a stroller. I was pushing him and I had my head down. I'm plowing through, you know, at that age, they're crying, they're, they're screaming, they're awake, they're not just trying to plow through another day and keep my sanity. And I, and I see you, I'm like, what, what the hell are you doing? Cause it was a weird location. It's not like a place where you would go to just go for a walk unless you lived where, where I live. So it was, uh, it was funny. You know, you, you mentioned Columbus and Amsterdam. I don't even know if we've talked about what street did you live on? 85th. So I was on 95th in Columbus for eight yep. years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so right, right there. And then, yeah, the, that um that journey I took one day, because obviously, you know, Topeka, she, she and the, the kids were, I think it was Raj and Ronnie at the time, were out of town. Rohan wasn't here yet. Yep. And I, I had heard something about Edgewater, New Jersey. So I took the ferry over to Edgewater. I think I had slides on. I didn't even have shoes on. I wasn't prepared. Uh-huh. But I get to River Road over there, and I'm like, what the hell is this? I yeah. didn't know this existed. And I walked all the way down. Then when I bumped into you, you vouch for it. I get on it the is. ferry, go mm-hmm. right across back to the city. I look up the building that's next to the ferry, mm-hmm. and that's the one we wound up moving into, which happened to be the one you lived in. Yes, yeah, yeah. And the <laughs> funny thing is, too, like I discovered like that side of, of the river – when let's see, so I got engaged. I met Jen in, in 08. We got engaged in 09. She moved from Dallas. And then, you know, she's like, Oh, well, let's live in the city. I'm like, no, 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 I'm leaving this. You're coming, you're coming to New York. I'm leaving the city. We'll get a nice spread in, in Hoboken. So I was on that side and 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 I was taking the the ferry, and it's you, you just you see the city in a way that I mean, I grew up in New York. I I never I just never went there. Why would I? Uh, and I'm like, this is awesome. There's a little weight room. There's a pool. There's uh, restaurants. It's a little cheaper. It's a lot bigger. I, I absolutely loved it. And the crazy thing is, or at least the cool thing is, it's really an awesome transitional place when you when you have kids, like when you're pregnant or when you try to get pregnant. Then when the kids are first born, it's 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 so awesome because there's so many people, friends that you and I both have. We we get together for the pool party at the Christiansons every every year with a bunch of the. Uh, uh, the old neighbors and friends go 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 at least the ones that live somewhat uh, near us still and it, it's it's you know it's it's almost like it takes a village and you've got the moms who are going through what they're going through you know breastfeeding and and obviously the daily rigors of, of being a mom and then we're doing the same minus the breastfeeding but we're going through the rigors of uh, different stuff and it was perfect because once the mom stopped breastfeeding and they could have their wine they can go and hang out for a little bit and we could go by the fire pit and we could do whatever we got to do to get through the day and get through the week. So it, it was perfect. I loved it. And now we live in the, the same neighborhood. Your wife um, helped us come over here, uh, of, yeah. of course, as well. And in lovely North Caldwell. And, you know, I was going to go I was going to go sports and then into career. But I think this transitions too easily because we're talking about, you know, our, our respective journeys. And it, it makes sense to talk career journeys, too, because when I came over to 1050, you were doing the show with Stephen A. Smith. I don't know yeah. how many people probably remember that you used to, you know, you used to do the show every day with Stephen A. Smith. What, yeah. what was that like? It was awesome, dude. It was, Scott, it seems like a million years ago. Uh, uh, by the way, I think, I think, I mean, I'm doing okay. I, I think Stephen's doing a little better. I think his trajectory, like, went to the moon. I'm not complaining. I'm, I'm very proud of what I have and and certainly, you know, aspire for more as we all do. But um, you know, I, I'm where I'm supposed to be at the fan and I, I've always wanted to be there, but Steven was interested. I'll never forget the first show he's at. No, I'm at where. Okay. So he's in studio. I hadn't met him yet. He's in studio 
And I am, because back then, 1050, you had to jump through hoops. I mean, no disrespect to 1050, but you had to jump through hoops to do remotes. And we didn't have really any baseball broadcast rights. So you couldn't be on the grounds of the various stadiums. So I'm doing the show from the platform of the LIRR. And now management's intention was not to utilize me. You know, Stephen was just starting to take off. And I think shortly thereafter, he got quite frankly, and they knew that he was there. He was their ticket superstar. And you knew it from day one. But I went in there saying, all right, I'm doing updates, which I hated, but it was a means to an end. And if he pulls me in, you know, it's his show. I'll be respectful. I'm not looking to take anybody's knees out. I, I understand my role here. I'll do my weekend shows. I'll do my Nick stuff. I'll do my SNY TV show. And long story short, the first call, like, I don't want to say that he was dismissive of my opinion, but maybe in a sense he, he, he like, yeah, maybe, maybe it was unintentionally dismissive. And I'll never think, I don't know who it was or where they were calling from. The first caller calls up and this, this, this made me feel good. He's like, listen, Stephen, A., you know, I love you. I love your energy. I love your vibe. I, I love everything you're about, but show that guy a little respect. BT knows his baseball, you know? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and that's where I think Steve was like, Oh, okay. And because it was baseball season, April 2nd, whatever. I remember Tom Glavin was pitching and, you know, Steven, admittedly, was incredibly weak on baseball. Certainly then. He's gotten better. He's tightened his game up with um, outside of basketball. He didn't well, know I don't baseball. think he has to talk. I don't think – I just don't think they talk about baseball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless it's, yeah. Unless it's like a steroid scandal or yeah. or something that is obviously not, not necessarily good for the sport but generates heat and clicks. And – in New York, and you know this because you've been on the air here for a long time, you, you got you to know baseball and got to talk it every day. And the Yankees were in the middle of their dynasty. The Mets spent some money with Glavin and Pedro. So there was some hope in Queens to get a little renaissance. And as, as the you know, week went on and then the weeks and the month and the months plural went on, he's like, man, this, this guy is – he knows his shit, number one. But number two, and I think this is where it really, really clicked. Like, you know, there was – there was just a connection. Like, I, I think that I think he he felt me like I'm from Brooklyn. He's from Queens. I love ball. He played ball. I played. And there was just an early, easy vibe. And he pulled me in more and more. And management hated it. And I just ignored them. And he ignored them. They'd yeah. come running in. Get him off the air. It's your show. And he's like, what, whatever. I love this guy. He's he's part of the show. So so that's how it started with Steven. And uh, to this day, you know, I, I still talk to him. He's always been very, very complimentary. You know, first take, if I text him about something, not that I want him to say my name, but he's like, you know, if it's about the Jets or something, he's like, yeah, my boy BT just texted me, you know, Brandon Tierney. He, you know, he's a good dude. He's always my brother. And and he'll go in whatever I may have texted him about. So he he's always showing respect that I love the guy. And he is the he is the top dog. He is the he's an absolute beast. Yeah, well, when I started there, I was a producer for Stephen A. Show and then for, for Max Kellerman's show, got called into the principal's office a bunch, figured yeah. out different ways to, to work myself on air. But, you know, yeah. I, I, I've been very open with this audience. They know my journey. They know the struggles that I'm currently going through. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of times people will see it from the outside and they don't realize the journey. I mean, you talk about being tough. I mean, you took some punches on the chin and got back up, right? I mean, I I when did. Ryan and I came together and, and we did the show, the time slot they put us in was the time mm -hmm. slot you were in, I believe, with Jody Mack at the time. Yep. And, and yep. now you're back on WFAN in, in middays in New York. But there was a big time in between. But there was never a time where you weren't doing something or working your way to your next thing. Can you take people through that period from when you I, left 1050 to back to the fan? I, I definitely can't. Like, it's... You know, first of all, in in the grind, there's there's character, you know, and, you know, I didn't I didn't know anybody in the business. Uh, I had no connections. I went to Marist. I studied journalism. I played baseball, you know. So I, I always knew what I wanted to do. It was a very unconventional route like you, you know, how you were able to carve out roles and insert yourself into the situation and then make those roles bigger. I, I'll never forget when they told well, well, first of all, just to backtrack for a sec. So me and Stephen A are doing our thing. And, you know, there, there was no, we had no signal. It was just, we had no chance to beat WFAN. And and I always thought, and I've said this publicly, and so, so is Stephen, like, if they would have just left us alone and just let us be us, and we actually had a signal, I honestly think that we, we would have been, I, we would have been number one. Like, I, I can't prove that, but, I, but I've always believed that. Now, he still would have gone where he's gone, and, 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 and there would have been a split eventually. I, I understand that. It's not like I'd be on first take next to him forever. Uh, but the struggle for me was Stephen A told them, well, they gave me the choice. They're like, hey, 
you've earned your own show. And they wanted to give me an evening show. I think it was 7 to 10, and I was doing the Knicks stuff at that point, too, pre-post and halftime. And, and I was very, very involved in a lot of things at the station, and I wanted my own show. I didn't want to leave him. I remember talking to him. He's like, dude, you need your own show. You, you need your own show. This is my show. He's like, you're a huge part of it, but the way their vision, blah, blah, blah. So that that kind of reaffirmed in my own mind that it, that it was time to jump on, on my own a little bit. But, you know, my career – it's it's never been linear. It just it was never easy. I graduate Marist. I go to Allentown, Pennsylvania. I'm doing morning shows. I'm making peanuts, sixteen thousand dollars a year in 1999. Um, I'm doing high school football games, fifty bucks. A I don't even know how to do play by play, but I said I could just mm -hmm. to get fifty extra bucks so I could go out on the weekend. Um, and then the station was sold, and I went to Las Vegas, rolled the dice of, as an update guy. Um, with a weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday slot on a national show. And there were some big names there, Rome, Pharrell. So I knew it was a good place to be. And, and then, and then they disbanded and they got bought out and that dissolved. And then I wound up, one of the affiliates that I was on was Detroit, the fan, which no longer exists, but was like XYT now just destroys it. They're pulling 13, 14, like their numbers are insane. But back then we were the big, we were the big show in town. They were number two. And since I was on the fan a lot, picking up my weekends up there, boss, Greg Henson, former PD, who who's probably one of my greatest champions. He's like, listen, get out here. Uh, I, I can't I don't have a show for you right away. Stuff's coming. Trust me, Robin. I was actually doing the, the, the weekend shows and I was delivering mail. I swear to God, I was taking mail from the sports station to the R&B station to the political station. Like I was just hustling. I was driving the car like I was doing whatever I had to do to get to get on the air. Then I walk in one day and one of the guys who had the midday show, he's like, listen, he's like, uh, I think today's going to be a good day for you. He's like, it's a bad day for all of us, but good luck. You earned it. Long story short, he got fired. It was a bloodbath. And I, unfortunately for me, fortunate, but unfortunate for everybody else involved, everybody was fired basically. And the midday show went from two men to just me. And I did very well in the ratings um, they tried to play me a bit with a contract that hadn't had an agent and I was there two years and I said, listen, cause the other station was a little interested in me. I said, guys, I'm not looking to jump. I'm not looking to, you know, do anything sideways here. I can't sign this contract. It was, it was just, I won't give you the, I'll give you the number off air. It was low and it was not commensurate with where I was at that point, anything but a star, but better than the number they put in front of me. I turned it down and I remember I'm, I'm and it was, it was, it was probably, probably the most pivotal move that I've ever made. First stand I took, here's here's a crazy one for you. Dan Patrick's brother. Dan Patrick's last name is Pew, P-U-G-H. I did not and his, know. Yeah, that, is that <laughs> Dan Pugh? And his brother, Dave Pugh, I think it's Dave, was the market manager for Detroit. So I'm in a room, no agent, the PD, uh, the associate PD or the assistant PD, the market manager, and somebody else from Clear Channel. And I turned down the contract respectfully. I said, listen, guys, I, 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 you have my allegiance. I'm, I'm not looking to leave, but I can't sign this. They said, well, you can't go back on the air until you sign it. I looked around the room. I, I don't really, at that age, I was in my 20s. I don't know how I, had, how I really had the balls to do this. I shook everybody's hand. I said, thank you. I remember walking to my, my desk, and it was shortly after 9-11. And I had all 9-11 stuff, New York stuff, FDNY, the towers, you know, everything. Took it down, some Yankee stuff. Boxed it up, went home, got wasted with one of my boys, who's the play-by-play -play man for the Suns, John Bloom. Shout out. Love him. And I languished for about a month or so, and I didn't have a job. And insurance was running out. I didn't really have much money in the bank. I didn't have any real friends in Detroit outside of one or two. I didn't have a real steady girlfriend. And it was the winter. I had nothing to do, man. So yeah. then, then 1050 came to the equation. And I went there. I know I jumped back, but I had to push you forward there to let everybody know how you got the 1050 in the first. Because it's yeah. not that the journey started after 1050. The journey began before 1050 and then continued. Yeah, after. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so after the after I so I get my own show. I can you know kind of confer with Stephen. I lean on him, get his get his thought, and I, I take the night show. I do well, and I'm happy. I'm really I'm truly happy. TV show at SNY. Next pre post halftime. It's three hours a night by myself. I'm I'm rocking. I'm I'm. I'm 31 and, and I'm feeling really good about my place in the business. Not cocky, but I felt like I arrived a little bit. And then they 
Colin, the, the, all this network, the, the miss, you know, the, the it's network. like where I mean, no, if you talk about Steven, but that's what happened to Ryan and I, you know, yep. later on, Steven came back, he was on at night, you knew he wasn't gonna stay there. We yeah. had the, the least foothold, and they blew us out. Eight months in, despite yep. good ratings, right? Like sometimes the breaks just don't go in your face. And, and you guys were doing well. There's, there, I'll definitely say it here. You guys were doing well. You were doing some different stuff, some some fresh stuff, some younger stuff. You were kind of, I think, as I, I look back, kind of evolving maybe before the medium was really, truly evolving. So I give you credit on that. And then I get a call from Dave Roberts one day, and he's like, we're going to uh, we're gonna get you off nights, put you with, with Jody Mack. I love Jody. Jody's, I, lo I, I love him. I, doesn't have a bad bone in his body. Old school, uh, very old school. And it was it was fun. I had a good time. I, I, I got along with him. Grant, I thought we did good sports talk shows. And then uh, my old producer, John Winthrop, who's now the PD, mm -hmm. comes in. He's like, Dave wants to talk to you after the show. And I knew that was it. Yeah. Now, what I've never really said publicly, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about this. Dave, I didn't get fired. Dave said, we're changing the show up. That's where you guys jumped in. And but we want to keep you around. We want you to do weekends, want you to do some night stuff, still do the Nick stuff. I said, I'm out. I'm done. I said, thank you. I'm good. And, and it actually got it got heated, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and and I knew that, you know, I had to stay in my lane and, and he was the boss and I had to respect that that power dynamic, which I did begrudgingly because I was fucking pissed. And I and I definitely I was done dirty. There's just no way around it. There's no way. There is no way the 1050 should have gotten rid of me. They just shouldn't have or, or marginalized my role, but they did. So now I've got a decision. I'm living in Hoboken, just married, no kids yet. And I'm like, in, in a way, Robin, it was galvanizing because 1050 was going nowhere at that point with that signal. I knew it. FAN still had, you know, Mike and Chris, Mike, they, they, they were on lock. Joe Beningo, the morning show was rocked. There, was, there wasn't a slot for me. So... I was curious if my phone would ring. At that point, I'm, I'm a free agent. Yeah, I've been a free agent before, but nobody knew me. Now I got work out there, TV, radio. Let's see if it rings. And it did. And it rang, thankfully, pretty quickly. Um, Chris Oliveira, who's my boss now, and uh, the best. Chris is, you know Chris, he is awesome. He like There's a lot of cool bosses and good bosses. There's not very many loyal bosses toward talent. And Chris has your back. But I'd never worked for him. So he's like, listen, he's like, I got, and Chernoff was involved in this as well. And I love Mark. Mm -hmm. They said, there's, there's going to be an opening for uh afternoon drive in Philly. And we think you'd be great. And I, I was obviously very interested. And I remember Chernoff saying, you could do some stuff on the weekend for the fan. And I'm like, Hmm, that, that could be my, my runway, my ramp to whether it's, you know, when Mike goes, when Mike retire, whatever might happen. The, uh, now I can see myself getting into FAN. But the problem was, I, I didn't think because I know me and I'm raw and when when I care about something, I can't let go. And I really thought just logistically 90 miles away, if I'm in Philly, even with the weekend shows on the fan, I'd be looking back at WFAN the whole time if I'm in Philly. Shortly thereafter, Jason Barrett calls, who is, you know him. Not only is he a great friend, he, he is a genius in our medium. Awesome guy and br brilliant mind. He calls me to do afternoon drive in San Francisco. So I'm like, okay, I'm feeling good about this. And you know, if I had kids and if I had a mortgage, I was renting, maybe it would have been a maybe different, maybe, maybe not. But I'm like, um, 30 midish, not quite mid thirties, but 34, maybe something like that. I'm like, man, San Francisco afternoon drive. If the business side matches and Maybe it's time to go and, you know, you went out to Vegas. You're not afraid to do this. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was really good for Jen and I. It was like, it's just, it's just us as a team, you know, married for six months, maybe. And I went out there and, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that the story went magically to number one, because we're going against KNBR, which was like WFAN. They had the Giants, the Giants won World Series. The, the Warriors were just the Like it was a tough battle, but it proved to me that I'm adaptable and, you know, whatever talent I might have is transferable. So I'm um, there for, I just signed an extension. I think I had a two year deal. And then I signed another, an, another extension. And then Chris Olivero, Oh, I'm in the parking lot getting ready to do my, my show Yankees and the A's at the Coliseum. And my, my former agent Lep calls me up and he go, I love him. Calls me because listen, they they're starting a network at CBS sports radio. They want you to be a huge part of it either afternoon or morning. They didn't know yet but they want you to be one of the main cogs. 
I'm interested. I'm like, get me home. And then I said, with who? And they're like, Tiki. I'm like, I'm in. You know, I, I, I want, I, I'm in. Make sure the business adds up. I remember texting Jen and I were going to dinner in Chinatown. And I said, Chris, if because I had just signed the deal. I said, Chris, get me to this number, whatever the number was, and, I, and I'm coming. I will get out of it. I promise. So he got me to the number and I got out of it. And I remember um, approaching my, you know, the, the main, the main executive, main suit at, 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 um, at the station of San Francisco. And when I told them, I actually, I got, got choked up because I'm not a quitter. They really rolled the dice on me, bringing a New York guy out to San Francisco and, and I'm loyal, but it was the right thing. Now it wasn't the right. So I left. It wasn't the right show right away. First of all, it was three of us and it was me and Tiki and it was Dana Jacobson. And you know, from ESPN, very talented, but it wasn't the right radio mix. I, I remember, and to Dana's credit. Three is always tough, by the way. It's just, it's, unless the unless the third is like, has a specific, you know, like they're the like I was maybe on, on some shows early in my career, but either way, yes. three is a, a tough dynamic. It, it's, it's tricky. And I remember I, I led the show, so I'm driving the show. And I remember the first, and again, this is to her credit. I, I, I don't, I'm not disrespecting her here because it takes gumption and talent to do this, but when the show starts, uh, we launched January 2nd. So the first Monday is we're talking like NFL playoffs or, or maybe it was the penultimate week, whatever it was, it was at the end of the season. And in my mind, I'm like, Tiki's the former player, you know, he's first. And and Dana jumped in and, and really, she said very good things because she's very good at her job. But I remember right away saying this, it can't, it's not, no, it, he's the former player. He's got to be, I got to tee him up. He's got to be more assertive. And at that point, he wasn't. So he wasn't really carving out his territory. And it just wasn't a great dynamic between the three of us. And then they moved on from Dana. And she went on. She's do again, she is talented. Uh, I, I've got a lot of respect for Dana. But then it became me and Tiki. And it was better. And it was natural. And it was the way I thought it would be. Um, we stayed in mornings for a while. And then... Gottlieb left and then we went to afternoons and they, they simulcast us. So there was a lot of jumping around and then Spike came and he said, listen, I've really, I've liked you for a long time. You're FA, you're an FAN guy. Nothing's happening yet. I just want to know that you still want us. I'm like, yes, I, I I'm, I'm bored of national radio, at least on CBS sports radio. I think if it was maybe a, a a platform and not to knock it, but with a little more visibility, there just wasn't any juice. Like, you know, and some of the things were really important. Like we were on during COVID, you know, race relations, which obviously me and Tiki, white, black dynamic, we can go wherever we had to go with respect, with intelligence. Like it was a smart show um, and it was a good show. You know, LeBron, Steph, Tiger, Phil, you know, the good, the good national storylines, but I just needed juice, man. And then, you know, I, I find out, hey, listen, we're going to mix things up a little bit. There's an opening. We're going to move you and Tiki to FAN. And then that was on January 3rd, 2022. Tiki's now with Evan. I'm with Sal, who was a nutball, but I love. And uh, it's, you know, it's funny. The thing about our show now, in my mind, as I look back, I don't even know that I really thought about this in real time when I was with Tiki on the fan, but the show that I'm doing now is the show that I always envisioned when I dreamt of going to FAN, falling asleep to WFAN, being in my car, going to play baseball or going to, you know, going to a construction job during the summer to make a few, but whatever it was, I listened to the fan and that energy, that Mike and Chris, just craziness. That's, and that's me. You know me, like I, you know, I'm, I'm loud and I'm, I like to talk and I, I like to mix it up and have fun and, and, be unpredictable and be a bit of a loose wire like that. That unpredictability is what is what keeps me really engaged and on my toes. And Tiki is brilliant and awesome. And I love him. But the sparks that me and Sal bring, this is this is the show that I want to be doing. Well, different dynamics. Like, let me let me go through some of the names that you've rattled off during this time period. That's One, a lot of names, man. Yeah, with Tiki, I used to do a, a, a weekly hit with Tiki on SI. So I, I, yes, sat, yes. I sat next to Tiki and, and talked to him for 20 minutes well, once a week, right? Sal, 
I used to spar with on uh, SNY. Yeah, I remember. On, the, on those late night shows, whatever they were called. Sports like, night. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I, I used to do that with Sal all the time. Maybe on Loudmouths uh, uh, too, when you're saying yeah. Loudmouths. That's then right. Then you go back through some of those other names. Jason Barrett, shout out to those guys for writing it up when I initially launched this show. Um, Mark Chernoff, I, I know. Chris Olivero, I actually don't know. So maybe you should make an intro for me. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I will. <laughs> He's... But well, I gave you the scouting report. He is a loyal, loyal boy, and 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 he goes back like he was an intern. He was a producer. Like you know, listen, there's certain things that that bosses can't protect you from if you color outside the lines too recklessly. Yeah. But Chris is the Chris the guy, obviously. But Chris is the kind of guy where he's got the talents back. Like you, you can be you. Like the Carl, I get Carl Banks that the shrapnel with Carl Banks. I was never worried about it. Now I didn't love that it happened, but it happened. And I texted Carl, and we smoothed it over. And I've known Carl for years. I love him, and and he and Sal got past it as well. We got past it as a show. He didn't come back, but that's fine. But I wasn't worried for a second. Like, oh man, you know, are my bosses going to flip out now? Where, whereas if that was maybe ten fifty with a totally different dynamic, I think it would have been handled differently and received differently from my former, maybe from some of my former bosses at. At 1050, Chris is, he is the best, best. Well, yeah, if you can name drop me for him, I gotcha. uh, name drop I gotcha. me to him, that'd be good. Uh, Dave Roberts was the other name that you mentioned. I don't think I've talked about him specifically on this show, uh, mm-hmm. but he's in a big place um, at ESPN right now. Don't want to disparage him too much because of that. Because he was, but the funny thing is, I, I think we've talked about this before. He was one of my biggest advocates. In fact, I was on the show with Ryan because of him, because he heard me and said, you've got something put you on it and everything was, was positive reinforcement with yep. him except for I, I know by the way I know I know that he liked you I know that he liked you yeah keep going I know that he liked occasions you. where I got the complete opposite of what I had gotten on 98 percent of the, the occasion yep. 98.7 percent yep. of the occasions I got positive yep. and then the yep. other 1.3 were like yeah oh, where did that come from yeah well that you know Dave is um now, Dave runs the show. I mean, Dave is Dave is the man up there, there's no doubt. Now, it's funny because our relationship started phenomenally. And even after I left 1050, we we had some interaction. There was a thought. Well, I mean, not a thought. There was there was actually a real movement's not the right word, but I'll just use it. Uh, or or undercurrent or possibility where I was gonna be on first take. Like, not a lot of people know this. I went to do um a demo with Stephen A. At some location, I don't know, I'd never even been there, some location or a mobile or a remote studio in Manhattan. And, you know, it, it just it didn't work out. They wound up going with Max and, and the ratings, you know, justified the hire and Max did great. And the way it ended with Max and Steven is is one thing. But, but you know, that was a good show. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I can't say that they got it wrong. But the like the thing I, I, I listen, I'll, I'll pull it back. I'll tell you exactly. I will. I will pull it back. I've never done this. So where it went and why I think it really went sideways at 1050. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. We remember we used to do at the at the DAC like lunch with a legend. Remember that with 1050? Yes, I, I, I do. I, I did a lunch with a legend with uh, um, uh, Seaver. Oh, uh, uh, yes. rest in peace, Thompson. God, that's a good one to do. OK, I did a couple with like LaGreca with with with, with um, Gary Carter. And I remember one, and I couldn't wait for this because he was my idol and he's my boy, Chris Mullen, right? So Mullen's in, and, you know, we've been doing this long enough. We don't get nervous. Maybe if it's a big spot, you're a little bit more in tune with performing, and maybe there's a a, a slight inner anxiety, which, if channeled properly, is obviously a good thing. Anyway, I I started with um, interviewing, you know, introducing Chris, and, and I thought... I thought that it was a pretty natural way to do it. Now, I've, Chris has been open about his demons with, with alcohol, checked into rehab. I mean, Don Nelson said, you got to stop drinking or you're going to be dead or you're going to be out of the NBA. Like Chris has talked about this. So it was nothing that I was bringing to the table that was that, that was out of pocket. It just wasn't. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I could have conventionally interviewed 92 Dream Team, you know, top 10 pick out of St. John's from Brooklyn. Yeah, I could have done that. What I did was, I said, you know, we're here lunch 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 with a legend and the premise of this is obviously to sit down and really do a long format with somebody that has impacted New York sports in a way that there if you and and quite frankly if our our guest today didn't slay some early demons I he's probably not sitting here today I I thought it was benign I thought it was unique um I thought it was a good way to get into the conversation and we had an awesome time right I'm on the 
Now, they were all the suits from ESPN at this point. And I'm on the dock waiting for the aforementioned ferry to go back yeah. to Hoboken. Yeah, yeah. And my agent calls me. And you know, I, I, I mean, I've known left for 20 years. At this point, it's probably 10 years. And he was at my wedding. So it's a very, it's like a friendly, it's not like, it's business, but it's not, it doesn't sound like, like business. He calls me up, he goes, what the fuck happened today with, with Chris Mullen? I go, what are you talking about? He goes, Dave Roberts just called me. He was, he was livid. You know, he, he thought that you, I, I don't, I won't put words in, in, in Dave's mouth, but basically that it was the wrong way to do it. And a lot of the suits from Bristol who were down there, they did not receive it well. So unbeknownst to me, that was the beginning of the end. That was the beginning of my end there. Um, and, you know, I, it, it's odd because before that, I remember being out with Jen. We were in Little Italy having dinner. And, you know, I, I love Gallinari. You know, all over Danilo Gallinari. He's going to be this. He's going to be this. He's going to be the next Derek, right? And I remember I'm out to dinner, and I think Jen went to use the restroom. And I don't even think it was a text. I think it was an email from Dave, Dave Roberts. He's like, oh, Gallo's looks great tonight. He had like 25 points. You know, it was early where he was really starting to flash a little bit. Like we had that kind of relationship. Sure. And then after the Mullen thing, it just soured. I mean, I didn't sour toward him because he's my boss. I'm respectful. But I felt um, a disconnect, a frostiness. And then eventually it, it was, you know, coming to my office and we're changing things up, which, you know, which stunned me and 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 hurt me. I, I got no problem saying it. I mean, we listen. We all have egos in this business and you're hired to be fired. We all know that. But to me, it was it was really it was just unjust because I think of New York radio and I think of I don't want to say think of me. That sounds asinine. But I think of somebody with passion and a certain rawness and an element of unpredictability. I was bringing all that. And, you know, going back to the day, like the way the the, the lineup was set up, Mike and Mike, incredibly successful Iconic morning show, no doubt, but a different kind of juice than what me and Steven would bring or I would bring or Max would bring when he was local or, you know, LaGreca and Kay would bring the different dynamic. Sure. But it was it was we had like, we had Dan Patrick. It was like it was just it was somewhat homogenized. And I thought that I brought enough to the table in terms of juice where like I, I was one of the few guys at the station, along with Kay and LaGreca and Steven, that were bringing like real headlines and ears and, and a little, well, all right, these guys aren't doing anything in the ratings yet, but shit, if they ever get a real signal, these, these guys, these guys are pretty good. And, and it really hurt, it hurt me. Like it, it, did it make me mad? No question. It, it made me angry, but it, in hindsight and in real time, it hurt. And I remember walking out of that building and I remember thinking, wow, what, what is next? And I remember specifically in a taxi, not even an Uber at this point, in a taxi going to JFK to catch our flight to San Francisco. And I, I remember just like looking out like, shit, man. Um, all right, you packed up whatever you have and you're bringing your game in terms of the microphone with you out West, but you're leaving behind a lot that you worked for. And, you know, I was nervous. I was a little unsure, but, you know, I did it. And, you know, maybe if I did it without Jen, it wouldn't have been as easy. Um, but it, you know, it, it 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 built more character. It taught me another side of the business, and I think it made it made, really made me better at the end of the day. It always hurts, right? Like it yeah. always hurts. I mean, like what I, I said with um Dave before, like he was my biggest advocate, and then it's like, whoa, you know, or or yeah. at various other points of, of of my right now, you know, what happened with SI the 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 second half of the SI cut off. The first half was fine because yep. it was fine, but it was the whole the whole kit and caboodle. Um, the second, you know, and then I, I mean, I did the show. I don't know if you saw it, but where I really uh, put myself out there and and put my emotions out there for everybody to see because there is no objective reason for it. And mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the numbers, it just you cannot make the argument. And when you do what you and I do, you have to keep your own self up. You know, you have to keep it is that self belief that keeps you going. And yes, keeps going. it's what had me launch this. It has me doing this talking to you right now. So, yeah, it, it always hurts because somebody didn't pick you, right? And you're thinking to yourself, I'm, yeah. the, I'm the best person for this job. And it's it's a public business, too. It's not just, you know, it doesn't just happen. It, or it's going to hurt in any field, any walk of life. You're going to yeah. have that similar feeling. But it's also happening for people to see. That's such a good point. Like, if you're a lawyer, um, 
And, and I mean, you'd, you'd have to do something to, 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 to get kicked out of a firm, but so maybe that's not the best example, but you're right. You can go back to your probably mansion and, and pour scotch or whatever you do to unwind if you don't drink. And, and I know you don't and, and, and props to, to really being authentic with that. That was one of the early shows. I caught that. That's good by you, man. And you can, you can wallow in, I don't want to say misery, but the, the reality for a little bit and not get hit from every direction. Like, dude, what the fuck happened? What are they thinking while they're crazy? Or, oh, you suck. You deserve this. It's about fucking time. You're gone. And, you know, I, I've learned it took me a while. It took me a while. But I honestly, I really, social media, I just don't care anymore. I don't. I, 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 I understand what it is. It's a vehicle for good. But it's really, it's an engine for discord. It, it, it's an engine for hate and jealousy. And I say good because charitable endeavors and GoFundMe's and, you know, things that are really important to the world. That's, that's where it's at its best, but people parachute in and they shoot, you know, they, they shoot whatever they shoot, they write down and then they just check on to the next thing. And really human emotion has been, has been, I talked about, I used the word marginalized before, but human emotions really been marginalized and it's dangerous. Now, you know, I've never had any public discussion about mental health or, anxiety and I, and I think I'm um I think I'm fairly stable with that. I mean, yeah, I get in my own head for sure. Um yeah, there's days where I'm like nobody can touch me. Nobody could what I just did in that 5 minute rant, there's nobody in the business including Stephen A that could touch that. Nobody. But then there's other days where I'm like fuck that didn't come out right or mm, did I say the wrong thing? So, I'm not immune to it either. And I I think if you can tune it out and probably about two years ago, I finally learned to do, I'll give you an example. Like, you know, I'm starting to post, I coach a lot, you coach a lot. And by the way, for your audience, he's a good coach. He's a good mm -hmm. coach. We'll get back to that at some point today. He's a good coach. He does Look a really good job. We'll, we'll transition off of this point. We will. Yeah, I definitely wanted to get to that. But Robin's a good coach. And uh, what I started doing, not even to monetize it, that's hopefully coming down the road. But, you know, when I'm inspired, and it hit me, I guess, two weeks ago, I dropped Colt off to um indoor baseball workout and it's his club team so there's no daddies watching it's get you know drop your son off it's high level stuff and leave get lost right we we got him and and i get it so i'm in the car and it's raining and i'm like you know just i don't know i just fake talking to people I, I did about a five minute video about youth coaching some of the perils and then i did it again last night maybe every week or two i'll drop it when it when, when it inspired when i'm when i'm inspired and those comments I'll look at because I want to interact and engage with people, right? Mm -hmm. And even in something that is purely rooted in good, I'm not knocking a player. So it's not like, oh, this guy's a fan of the Mets and he thinks I said something about Lindor, so he hates me, or Daniel Jones if he's because I'm a Jets guy, whatever. It's not even that. It's about the most pure thing in the world: kids, coaching, giving up time, and and more specific. Because I'm not looking for a medal. Every a lot of people do it, but more specifically. Taking what I know, because I did play at a high level division one, and I think I'm a decent coach. I try to be pretty good, um, certainly engaged and, 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 and give as much time as I can uh, without dropping dead from exhaustion. And there's actually comments like you're a buffoon on the radio. And, and there's a lot of really good ones that make you feel good, but sure. nothing that is applicable to what the content is about. And I see that. And back in the day. I, I still wouldn't fire off because I watch what I write. I'm still very smart about that, and, and I won't deviate from that. But that would have bothered me. And now I'm, I just see it. I'm like, dude, if you're that miserable to parachute in on a good thing and try to twist it into a bad thing, that's a you problem. That's that's not my issue. Yeah. No, I mean, look, you're right. There's there's a lot of of that out there. The, I guess the, the plus side is there is more ways to get yourself Mm -hmm. out there and, and cut through and, and start your own thing and all that. But there's the perils that come with it. But let, let's just piggyback on the, the coaching of the kids thing, because that is a, a pure thing that we're both into. You know, we, we are very, we're similar, but very different, right? Like, yep. I, I think that's a fair way to put it. You know, we've had similar career paths, similar interests, but we have different personality types, different yep. approaches to things. But we, we both really love coaching the kids and working with them. And, and um, I don't think, have you, I don't, you, you haven't coached my kids. Uh, no. No, I don't no. think. It's, no. They haven't played. You know, you're you're really in tune with the baseball. And, and Colton, your son, is a phenomenal athlete and a, a super competitor. Thank um, you. But, you know, what what is it about that 
that resonates with you so much because, you know, we, we do have our, I think I'm a little bit more intense than you probably realized as a coach, but I also am, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have a different, you know, sort of motivational style at the same time. Well, first of all, you know what you're talking about. Let, let's start with that. And my first experience, um, and, and I'll give you an answer, like what, what, like what is appealing and, and why I gravitate to it. But first about you, like, <clears throat> so I know you played a lot of soccer. I, listen, the thing about being, not only being a coach, being a parent, you got to know what you don't know. You have to like, and I don't know. So I didn't play a second of soccer. I played baseball in college. I played basketball growing up. I, I made the, I made the high school team. I got kicked off because I was a knucklehead, full disclosure, made it, got, played the whole year, got kicked off second year. And, and that still crushes me, but that's so long ago. But I was, I was an idiot. I was in an old boys Jesuit Catholic school that took no nonsense. Um, and I colored outside the lines, not bad enough to get expelled, probably close a few times, but I, I screwed myself. Right. So I know what I know that that's the point of even giving you that backdrop, but I never coach football. So when my son plays football, I lay out, I watch, I got my lawn chair. I know all the guys in town. There are a lot of good friends, but I let them do their thing. And when I watched you coach, like, because you're not as outwardly aggressive with your delivery, mm -hmm. um, you're more, well, certainly you have a comedy base because, and you've talked about that on the show. I know about your stand up stuff and you're, I think we're both very cerebral and intellectual, how we process things. I didn't think, and I was pleasantly surprised by this. This was, this was, this was awesome. I remember told, I told you this a lot and I told your wife who's awesome. I love your wife. And my, my wife loves your wife. I said, all right, well, how is it going to be with these kids? And I thought you had, not that I thought you would be bad, but I'm like, how, how, will, what's his actual approach? And you were more direct and you, you held the kids accountable. I think number one, you teach, you inspire. Uh, I think you've got great adaptability depending upon the level of talent, which is imperative. D depending upon the level of maturity, you could have an incredibly talented kid who's less emotionally mature. Uh, and my son went through that when, when he was young, young, young. He's fierce, on you fierce. And if he makes a mistake or he gets out, certainly when he was seven, um, even a little bit into eight, the angry tears and like that would drive me insane. And you, you were good with it because he's not your son. So you handled it very well. Uh, and and then I watched you with basketball and you're you're very vocal. Um, we, there was there's a league, just so everybody knows it's 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 called upward. It's basically like CYO. It's first and second grade. Oh, well, it's first grade and then it's second, not, not jointly, but it's first and then second when you when you get on to second grade. And it's a great introductory. It's like it's it's a small court. The rims are eight feet. Everybody there to have a good time. Um, but you want to win and you want Raj to be to be to become a good player, right? And I want to win and I want my son to become a good player. So I'm watching you and I'm coaching, but I'm watching you when you're coaching and you're barking out that watch back door, set the pit, you know, communicate. Let them know there's a pick. Like, I don't, I don't know too many people who are doing that with first grade kids. We both do it. And you do it in, in an intense way that I didn't, but not an overbearing way, um, in a very locked in way. And I think that that is, that's, that's very impressive, dude, because anybody who coaches and volunteers their time, they are rooted in good. Okay. But that everybody knows that. But I think what separates, the real difference makers, do you know the game? Can you communicate what you know to the kids? Can you challenge the kids? They're not babies. It's not like, all right, Joe, here's a here's a little two hopper, catch that. No, no, throw a short hop. You're not, not gonna hurt you. It's a wiffle ball. So what? You miss it. Throw a short up, throw a pop-up, you know, vary the looks, get the eyes going, get the feet going, connect the eyes, the hands, and the feet. And and those are things that that I always did, like with Colt in the backyard. And then when I started coaching him and even Kinsley's softball team. Uh, and 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 I saw you do that stuff, and I was just very impressed, man. You, you're a good coach. I told you that. No, you have, and thank you. And, and for all the connections that we've had over the years, I don't want to um, fool the audience to to say that we were like great friends or anything. No, we weren't. No. Um, and, and and I do appreciate um, the kind words you've had for me and the the relationship we we begun cultivating since we've been over here. So I'm putting that to you, and I'm putting that out for everybody to hear. 
so that you can hear me saying that to you in front of everybody. I appreciate that. Now, yeah, because we, we are similar in a lot of things, but we're very different in a lot of things. And quite frankly, Rob, here's the bottom line. You know, I remember, this is going back a ways in the conversation today, but when I met you and I had the apartment, I'm like, hey, this place is pretty good. And then you wound up moving there. And then obviously we're basically down the street right now. I remember Colt was just born uh, and then eventually my, uh, Jen was pregnant with Kins. And in my mind, right, I got my friends. Like, I, I don't need new friends at that stage of my life. I got a couple of boys from college. I go to play golf on the weekend. I'm not look, I'm not going clubbing. I'm not going out to a bar and getting wasted and coming home at 3 o'clock in the morning with my wife saying, where are you? That's not me. Now, I'm going to have a little fun. I'm gonna, whether it's a fire pit, whether it's on the golf course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carve out space to unplug. She knows it. She's awesome with it. And when I unplug, I can unplug. I can have fun. And I, I can, I, you know, I can, I can get after it a little bit. But I, I remember her telling me, like, you got to come out or you got to meet the dads. You got to, I'm like, I don't want to meet. I, I really don't want to, mm -hmm. especially, and you can relate to this, when you do what we do for a living. Because invariably, and, and I appreciate this, but it can be overbearing and exhaustive sometimes, when you meet new people, Let's say you meet seven guys uh, between the age of 35 and 45. Of the seven guys, five are going to know what you do. If, if, if they're even remotely locked into sports, probably more. And I get it because if I was a lawyer or if I was a whatever, and I was you know in a group with, with a guy who was a sportscaster, you know, did it for a living, and I love sports, I, I want to talk sports. I, I get it. And, and I, I'm very giving of my time. But I didn't open my mind up to meeting new friends. And and I think that applies to us. And I remember, I don't, hopefully you don't mind me saying this. I remember we were at a party about a month and a half or so ago at Montclair. Yeah, that's, that's where I just said what I said to you just now. Oh, because okay, of what so, you said to me then. Yes. Okay, that's what you're referring yeah. to. I yeah. even told Rob because I think I'm more extroverted, more whatever. And once you know Robin, Robin will open up and Robin's got a huge heart. But I even told you, granted, I was, uh, we were both a little bit uh, a little sideways having a good night, but not, not, I was. Oh, I wasn't. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Well, you don't drink anymore. You would, you know, and I, I, I don't want people to think that you were drinking when you don't drink. Okay. Maybe we were doing, you know, we were having a yeah, good time with some other stuff. And I remember saying, I'm like, man, we, I remember we were in the back of the party and the girls were dancing, whatever they were doing. And, and I was like, man, I'm like, you are hard to crack. I'm like, you are hard to become friends with it, 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 basically those words. And I'm like, I'm putting it out there because our wives are so close and they trust each other and they, they get along amazingly. Now, even if we don't have that, I'm like, I got to find a way for me and Robin to get not on the same page because we were never enemies or never, but we, we were never, we had never connected. I'm like, it's time. We're in the same neighborhood. We coach our kids. I mean, same age. Let's go. And you were just very receptive. And I figured you would be. That's why I said it. And really, since then, um, I've noticed a little more um, openness maybe on your end. And and I think when I see that, I, I think I deliver some more openness. So I'm, I'm happy I said it. I'm happy you received it. Well, you know, and I'm, you know, anybody who's in the audience will know how open I am in that uh, in this forum, um, in, in that sense. And when I do get emotional, it's very sometimes, you know, I'm in that that night, I think was fresh after what had first happened. So I'm trying to keep myself strong, yep. keep myself together. And there's a whole bunch of people I know who I know know, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. So I go in knowing that they know, but I don't want them to see it. You know, it, it, it's like that balance of letting yourself feel and deal with it, but also keeping yourself up. So maybe I put a little bit of a wall up in Got regard it. because of that, if that makes sense. It does. That was a fun night, too. That was a fun <laughs> night. Sure. <laughs> that's a good night. That's a good night. I'm not even gonna get into the sports thing. Last thing I want to get into because I'm going to um WrestleMania. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, with this weekend when this airs, it'll be tomorrow. We're going. Sweet. So, uh, you you dressed up as Goldust oh, on the air. Do you know who Goldust is? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, it loosely translated, I feel like he's everything, isn't he? Like, there's been so many variations. Well, well, well I mean, you know who his brother is. Yeah, his brother is Rhodes. Yeah, Cody Rhodes. Is, yeah, yeah, who is, yeah. Who is who has been in this feud with The Rock in a yes. sense and is yes. main eventing. So he's he's in a tag match, Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins against The Rock and Roman Reigns on night one. Night yep. two, Cody Rhodes is looking to finish the story against Roman Reigns and end what has been a three and a half year championship reign. That long? 
which is, yeah, a long time in today's day and age. Roman's been the champion for three and a half years. Good um, run. That, yeah, that's, if he, yeah, if he makes it to September, he would break Hulk Hogan's record for the modern era. Then the only person ahead of him would be Bruno San Martino. What, well, what about Backlund? Because Backlund and my early old school stuff is better than my stuff now, admittedly. But Backlund had the t- Backlund got the belt. I feel like Bob Backlund, and he was a boring champion. He was actually a real wrestler, as you know. But he had no, no no stick game. He was horrible on the mic. He was boring. He just had no pizzazz. But he could wrestle. He, he was a tough dude. Um, and, 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 and he was over. You know, not like Bruno because the Italian New York thing. But Bob would make money. I think that Bob Backlund may have had it for 2,000 plus days. I'm looking at it now. Five, five so, years? I'm thinking yeah. the, uh, well, when I say the modern, I'm thinking like Bruno San Martino and Backlund are sort of before that because it was yeah, yeah, before, gotcha. before it was on TV and, yeah. and everywhere. So Hulk Hogan to me is like the start of the modern era. I understood. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Who's your and favorite you know, of all time? The funny, the funny thing though, Rob, about the gold dust thing, you know, that's something I don't think I would have done that a couple of years ago. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like I wouldn't have welched on a bet, but I probably would have put myself in position to be, um, to have to dress up. At, remember, I was at the mercy of whatever Hoff. It was, it was a show thing. It was me and Sal and Hoff, yeah. and it was a you know culmination of NFL. I love pick. Hoff, by the way. Good guy. Hoff's the best. Hoff is a true. He's 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 a great dude, and he's funny. He's authentic. He's he's good people. I love Hoff, and the losers plural were subjected to whatever the winner made them dress up as from a WWE perspective. You could not, you had to do it. It could have been Alpha and Sika. It could have been Fuji and Saito. I mean, it could have been Bam Bam Bigelow and uh, the, the the big boss man. It could have been anything. It could have been yeah. Fabulous Moolah and Wendy Richter. I, I don't know. And I'm like, fuck it. Let's do it. I, now, I thought I was going to win, right? And me and Sal were saying, we're like, hey, listen, ha, huh? all right. Once we knew he was going to win. Just don't make us sit out there for four hours because we had to do the show dressed in Speedos. I mean, at the age of 50, I'm in decent shape, but yeah, I'm not looking for the whole world to see my dad bod. And same with Sal. That was yeah. the only concern. Makeup, dress, what a skirt. I, it, it didn't matter. Now, when he dropped the, and I finished in second place, and the second place winner got to choose of the two options. So I'm like, oh, shit. Like, th- then credit to Hoff because it was an unwinnable choice. I'm like, all right. If I go gold dust, you know, he's a drag queen, right? I, I, I mean, isn't that gold dust, bra- gold dust preyed on homophobia in a sense before, you know, that was a much more accepted part Open, of, of yes. the culture. You know, he, he had gone against Razor Ramon. And, and I remember people like, you know, there were maybe certain words that were thrown out. Oh, gold okay. dust that got you it. Can't, and you shouldn't say. Oh, 100%. You no, said you said that, but you, you, you can't. It shouldn't you can't say, say today, no. no, you, you can't do it now for sure. So I'm like, all right. So, uh, but I also remember Piper and Goldust beating the shit out of each other in the, the van. And yeah. like, he, 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 he looked more masculine there. So I was, so, and there was also a lot of variation. So I went, I'm doing the, the Google picture hunt. I'm like, all right, if I do this, um, I, I, okay, that's the softest landing for Goldust. If I do doink, uh, I'm a man. No matter what, you know, like there's no when you do gold dust, there's a certain level of uh, you know, self dignity you have to be or you know to be able to put yourself out there. I'm, I'm uh-huh. gold dust versus when you're a, there's no way around a clown, you yeah. know. And, and credit to Sal for me, but I think yeah, he had yeah, a yeah. that day that wound up blowing up, and he, oh, he's, oh. he's a clown. No. In the tape. Dude, <laughs> dude, let me tell you something. When, oh my God, the, what what Robin's referencing right now? We're both. It just find a picture, find it on YouTube. We look like complete wackos, right? And we did the makeup ourselves. We actually like I leaned into it. I uh, like we really. So did he. He did a great job with the clown stuff. And he was he was yelling. You know how he gets. I think it was about the Mets. And he's like, listen. Oh, it was a, about a caller. And he's in a like mid rant. And and I think I think. Maybe the caller even called him a clown. He's like, yeah, that's great. You could call me. I'm not a clown. I'm a host on WFAN dressed as a clown. And he says, I'm not a clown. It was the funniest shit that I've ever seen. And and we both leaned into it. And and I again, I don't know. You know, I don't know if I would have been able. I would have enjoyed it, certainly. Again, I wouldn't have welched on the bet. I don't think I would have enjoyed it as much a couple of years ago. I think that's just, you know, me getting older and, and maybe wiser and, you know, more open to some stuff, having a little more fun. And 
and push the boundaries a bit, like, fuck it. I mean, okay, great. You dress as gold dust for a day. Fantastic. Now people will say, all right, you manned up on the bet. You look like gold dust for the most part. He looks like doink. And let's do a show and look like idiots for four hours. And we did. I would have produced one of those gold dust vignettes for you and edited it as a video and you could have yeah. posted it on social and everything. Yeah. 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 yeah I know. I will. I'm, <laughs> I'm there. I actually like stenciled it out. Um, I mean, it was, I'm like, I have to shave because I got to make sure it goes on smooth. Like it was a whole operation. I I'm getting shit from Amazon for like a week straight gold makeup, black makeup. I'm, ironically, I'm getting ready to get a quick, quick workout. in. I actually ordered this. I just threw this on for the show. I ordered this for, I'm like, cause I don't know exactly what I'm going to wear. I'm like this, I know his colors. I'm like, just in case the other shirt that I ordered doesn't, I mean, I, I was jumping through hoops to look like this guy. It, it, it was actually fun. I thought that Hoff was going to make us doink and dink. Oh. That's what I thought he was going to do. Nobody knows who dink is. So it was a good call. Gold dust. Gold yeah. dust is going to, in fact, you need me to send, send me a picture of yourself as gold dust. Jesus. I will make that the thumbnail. For this episode, that well, I don't. Be, I mean, I don't know if I want that. You don't want that? Why are you there? Yeah, you can talking about it. I'll, I'll text you. Yeah, I'll right. text. You. Okay, Brandon, I appreciate you uh, taking the time, being so open. Uh, appreciate us becoming friends over these years. Thank you, man. Uh, you can hear Brandon Tierney, Sal Licata, Monday through Friday, WFAN, ten to two. Appreciate you coming on the show, dude. Dude, it's my pleasure, man. I I, I know uh, we were trying to get with this a while ago. It's taken a little longer than than we thought, but I I always had this somewhere in my mind. I'm like, I I got to, I want to do it. I'm gonna do it. I I appreciate the invite. Um, and just to reiterate, man, like, um, I haven't seen everything that you've done with this, but first of all, you should be somewhere, you know, and you will be, and and you know that, and you're a talented dude, and you're smart, and you're funny, and you're unique. All right. But I think that the best thing that you did early on was that, again, that level of transparency when you talk about the drinking and you just, if you're going to do something like this, there's only one way to do it. And, and you tapped into something that, that fits you well. So yeah, man, I mean, let's, uh, let's hit the fire pit one of these nights and, uh, you know, have a good night. You know what I mean? Yeah, no doubt. And, and remember to drop my name to Chris Olivero. <laughs> I will, I will, I will tell him, I'll tell them, dude. All right, man. I'll